Rita Joe. That's good too. I'm all my my middle name is Josephine. Okay, so anyway, so Friday night we are showing the movie of the month. Um, we always have spiritual cinema. We're going to be doing the uh, Way of the Priestful Warrior, uh, based on the book by um, Dan Millen. Is it Millen? Millen. Millman. Thank you. I knew. And um, anyway. It's, if you haven't seen it, if you've seen it, I don't know, I've seen it about four to four or five times. I love it. So that's happening. And then on July 7th, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, we will be at Lydgate Park at the big pavilion celebrating our sixth anniversary on the island of Kauai. Yeah. And the Sacred Earth Choir will be joining us. And then there have been some people very diligently, Emma and Sue and Peggy working very diligently on this beautiful silent auction that we're going to have. And I'm telling you, um, we have amazing things like helicopter rides and, and catamaran and restaurant gift certificates and like major stuff. I mean, it's really good and it's just great. We're so grateful. And um, so if you, even if you have, know people that don't come to CSL usually, just tell them to come to the silent auction. And all the funds that we raise are going toward our expansion. So. It's going to be really, it's amazing. Thank you, girls. Girls. Well, that was yeah, like, like when do we do that? When do we used to call people girls? <laughs> okay, and then um, I want to tell you all, too, just so you know, we now have an app. It's called Sunday Streams. All Sunday Streams. It's, it, and you can download it on your phone. And if you put in CSL Kauai as your login, you will be able to see our videos. You'll be able to see us live. If you're in your car, well, you wouldn't be watching, but <laughs> you want what? Oh, yeah, all one word, lowercase. Sunday streams and then CSL Kauai as your login. And it's very cool. And so ask me about it or Rob if you don't know about it. It's pretty easy to download it on your phone. So I wanted to let you know. And I also want to let you know that we have two special things that I just want to mention that are going to be coming up in August. So you have, you're the first to hear. Carrie and Michael Fox are going to be back on island. Yay. <laughs> and they're going to do a concert. Yay, right? On the 23rd of August. On the 23rd of August. And then on August 30th, I am going to be doing <laughs> my own flying solo called How I Came to Me. And it's going, it is, it is a um, singing piece. I'm going to be singing a lot of songs and basically telling you guys a lot of stuff about myself. And it all has to do with men. So, <laughs> for, yeah, it'll be recorded. Yeah. Anyway, I, and <laughs> Carrie, Carrie Fox will be my accompanist. So I'm really excited. And that's why we were able to do it because she's going to be on island. Anyway, that's all I wanted to tell you. And, um, you know, we're expanding, guys. It's a lot. We're growing, and there's a lot of wonderful things happening. So we are ready now. No, we're not ready? Pray. Oh, I have to pray first. <laughs> okay, he wants me to pray before he comes up here. Center us, now that I've been all giggly. All right, so let's just take a deep breath together. <sighs> we are standing on holy ground because we are here. We are here, and we are sacred. We are beautiful. We are magnificent. That is what I know. It's just pouring through us. We are the infinite intelligence of spirit of God, of the presence at all times. So I know that tonight is filled with that, that there is something special here waiting for each and every person, and that it is a divine appointment. And I just bless this, this man called Tony Robbins, knowing that there's something special that he has to offer us tonight. And I'm grateful for all the good work that he has done in our world. It is amazing. I'm grateful we get to share that tonight through the essence of Patrick Farron, knowing that he brings to us the amazing story of Tony Robbins in his own unique way that touches souls, I am sure. So I just say, let the evening unfold and, and, let it be relaxing and peaceful and joyful and fun and exciting. And let it be good for each and every person here. That I know. And so with that gratitude in my heart, I simply take this word I've spoken. I let it go and I release it as law, as we affirm together. And so it is. Yeah. So now I introduce Patrick Farron. Yeah! Yeah! Can I hear I? Can I hear I? 
Very nice. <laughs> wow, you, I just was dying to do that. <laughs> Woo! That was me for my energy a little bit more than even yours. You as Tony Robbins. That was me. As I was. I was. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful evening. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out in this gorgeous rain that we have. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do tonight as I, I've been spending some time I, I, with this Tony Robbins and so many tapes, 30 years he's been around, 40 years actually, but 30 years and just immersing in this man. And, and I wanted tonight to, to, yeah, give his history and who he's been married to three times or twice. And, and that, that's, that's lovely, but there's so much more. And, and it's really funny because he's in the New Thought series that we do here. And I just want for me, my, my goal, my intention is to, to see why he is, why he's been chosen to be a part of this New Thought series because he has brought it in a very different way, but a very powerful way uh, to this uh, movement that we are all in, this healing movement. And I just think it's just I'm so honored to be able to do that. So. I want to make sure that tonight, one thing I want to do is, bah, 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 bah. I think we've had enough of that. Okay, I want to tell you about my beginnings with Tony Robbins. Picture this, New York City, fourth floor of a brownstone, 70th and Central Park West. A third, I know everybody goes, ooh, <laughs> you know. And here was uh, this wonderful, dashing young man, 30 years old, hitting New York like James Dean, getting there. <laughs> That's me. Uh, oh, is this about Tony? Oh, but, but all I know is that I was on the fourth floor of this brownstone. And I was going through what most actors do, smoking my cigarette, drinking my red wine, wondering why I'm unemployed, <laughs> and, and saying, I'm in New York, though. It doesn't matter. And I got kind of like, what am I going to do with my life at 30? And so I was watching these info commercials for you youngsters. They used to be on quite a bit. And it would be like 2 o'clock in the morning. wonder what the hell I'm going to do with my life. <laughs> and there was Tony. What are you doing right now? Are you sitting on the couch? Is that what you're doing? Is that what you're doing? You get off the couch. There's life to live. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me more, Tony. Tell me more, Tony. Because I'm going to be somebody just like you. So that was my, and they looked just like that because they're cassettes. They were cassettes in the little white little, oh, a cassette for you youngsters is, is, is the afterlife of the eight track. Um, so, so the reason I bring this up is because Tony came at the two moments in my life that were very, very critical for me, and that was one of them. Sitting out there going, I'm in New York City, I'm 30 years old, and I'm unemployed as an actor, and I came here for that. And so I listened to him. There are 30 days. And I can remember my mom. I was on visiting or something. And I, and I go, I have to do this. It's in the morning. There's Tony with my little. And he was, like, and he was talking like this because he's got that raspy thing going on. And my mom goes, he sounds interesting, but what's wrong with his voice? You know? And I said, I go, that's power. That's power, mom. So I was a real Tony fanatic. And then one other time, years and years later, I had a depressed moment, if you can imagine. No, I cannot either. But I was going through, I wouldn't say the clinically depressed moment, but I was going through another, wow, what am I going to do now? And Rita, to be really honest, because we're very authentic and very real here, was a little concerned. So what did she do? You can do anything you want. I was, I didn't even really know who Tony Robbins was. And so I was worried about him and I saw so I was sitting up at night like really late in the morning like 2 o'clock in the morning and an infomercial came <laughs> on <laughs> and I went oh my god I need to buy this for Patrick and that's what and I it was him. his newest one that was, was that was now in CD form 
so we can look at that as a really powerful thing that, that now all these years later, I'm still depressed, or we can look at it, no, or, or we can look at it as though that was a powerful moment. And so I figured that's what I would start us with. But I always feel that these things are best, uh, hey, Donna, um, they're best, um, hey, um, they're best done with an actual little video of him. So he did a TED Talk in 2006, and though this will be a chron chronological evening, <laughs> not, um, I have so many stories and so many things and so many deep things about, about his life that people don't usually get to hear, and so that's what I'd like to introduce tonight along with all of the other stuff. So I'm going to talk about Tony just before that. So, is it, don't, you don't have to get frustrated, you know I could be up there. If you miss this, Tanner, that's a cassette. Those are cassettes, there are they're these, uh, there's these little things. But I, but I say that because he has, um, I loved his energy. His energy was something that I could relate to because I have a little bit of that in me. Just a little bit. And, right Renee? <laughs> and so, a lot of times, while she's doing, oh, it's ready? Okay. Well, let me just finish that thought. A lot of times we think of somebody that's very big and out there and over the top, it almost feels like, as not always authentic. And that's what I'm really, really wanting, because I have been accused of that, not in this Kauai lifetime, but in other lifetime of me, that my excitement and my passion for life was you know, is it real? Because it's so over the top, it's so big. And so I, that's why I relate to him, because he is authentic, and I'm authentic, and we're all authentic. We just show it in our own way. So there is Tony Robbins. So I have another story. No, I'm just kidding. So take a moment here to know that in the infinite, infinite intelligence that there are no glitches because infinite intelligence is what created, Patrick created, Tony created each and every one of us right here and right now. So I just know that this thing called technology that works always beautifully right before you come. And, and, and we have it down to an absolute science. It returns now to... Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about, no, I, I don't, I mean, the, we're family here, we don't need to, what, what gets people why, it's, why things get clumped up like this, just an FYI in my metaphysical terms, is because the person clenches thinking that there's an expectation and a pressure of the person that's where she's at. So we know that that's not true. But what we do know is I do want to tell you a little just a bit about, that's not on these, about his beginnings and his beginnings as a very, 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 very poor kid. And uh, one thing I have found out, that it's, that it's that poverty that actually motivated him and the pain that motivated him. But as we go on through the evening, I'm not positive, and I am positive in my belief system and in science of mind and spirit that we do not have to learn through pain. And I think, as, as he said, as many have said, we have been trained that life is a struggle and we're going to have to work through this stuff. And in reality, we do not have to do that. But he said that it motivated him. And one of the things that are the best in, the, um, in the, uh, one of his stories about decision making, because he's a master decision maker, and the decision making was this. It was Thanksgiving. They missed many Christmases, Thanksgiving, and his dad was yelling at his mom, and his mom was yelling at his dad, and they were having this horrible thing, and the doorbell rang. And somebody was standing there with like two huge boxes of food, and he was so, Tony was, I think, about seven, and he's going, wow, this is like a miracle. This is a miracle. Somebody has come here with... 
I thought we were doing it old school. I like old school. Oh, are you talking about it's going to be playing through there? Yeah. Gonna to I'm good. But let me finish the story now that you've, I've started it, okay? Right. So he was seven years old, and they came to the door with this food. And he was so excited, and his father came out, and he said, Dad, come to the door, come to the door, come to the door. Look what happened. It's like a dream come true. So he comes in there, and he said, we don't take no effing uh, charity. Get out. And so the guy put his foot in the door. He said, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. He said, we don't take charity. We, there is no charity coming into this house. I provide for my family, and that's it. And Tony's just standing there, just like, you've got to be kidding. There's food. We're going to have Thanksgiving. So you see where his, his mindset was oh, a gift, and his father's was no. So this guy came in one last time, and, put, and he said, listen to me. That kid over there and the other kids in this house, they deserve better than this. This has arrived. This is an opportunity for you to give to these kids. And he said that that was the moment of reckoning that in a very interesting way when he realized that decisions can go many ways. And his decision was, there's, there's, something, there's something bigger than me out there that delivers food and allows this. And he had that passion. And his father took in the decision I can't take care of my kids, and I'm a horrible father, and he left the family. So he, he took that moment in time as the decision to make it, right, that I'm no good, I'm out of here, and Tony took it as, I'm going to never have to experience this again because I am going to, and he'll talk about it later, I'm going to be delivering boxes to somebody's door someday. And, and that's my drive. And that's what's going to make me. And so this is a seven-year-old boy that we now get to know later on. Anyway, let's just do the best we can, guys, all right? Well, we've done it this way before. on and listen. I have to tell you, I'm both challenged and excited. My excitement is uh, I get a chance to give something back. My challenge is the shortest seminar I usually do is 50. Oh, so sorry. So sorry. No matter what happens, they find a way to be happy or excited. Sorry. More than that, obviously, coach people. But I'm into immersion because how'd you learn language? You didn't learn it by just learning principles. You got in it and you did it so often that it became real. And the bottom line of why I'm... I have to tell you, I'm both challenged and excited. My excitement is uh, I get a chance to give something back. My challenge is the shortest seminar I usually do is 50 hours. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I do weekends, and what I do, I do more than that, obviously, coach people, but I'm into immersion, because how'd you learn language? You didn't learn it by just learning principles. You got in it, and you did it so often that it became real, and the bottom line of why I'm here, besides being crazy mofo, is that I'm really in a position, I'm not here to motivate you, obviously, you don't need that, and a lot of times, that's what people think I do, and it's the furthest thing from it. Um, what happens, though, is people say to me, well, I don't need any motivation, and I say, well, that's interesting, that's not what I do. I'm the why guy. I don't know why you do what you do. What is your motive for action? What is it that drives you in your life today, not 10 years ago, or are you running the same pattern? Because I believe that the invisible force of internal drive activated is the most important thing in the world. I'm here because I believe emotion is the force of life. All of us here have great minds. You know, most of us here have great minds, right? I don't know if I'm in the category, but we all know how to think. And with our minds, we can rationalize anything. We can make anything happen. We can, uh, I agree with what was described a few days ago about this idea that people work in their self-interest. But we all know that that's bullshit at times. You don't work in your self-interest all the time. Because when emotion comes into it, the wiring changes in the way it functions. 
And so it's wonderful for us to think intellectually about how the life of the world is, and especially those who are very smart. We can play this game in our head, but I really want to know what's driving you. And what I'd like to maybe invite you to do by the end of this talk is explore where you are today for two reasons. One, so that you can contribute more. And two, so that hopefully we can not just understand other people more, but maybe appreciate them more and create the kinds of connections that can stop some of the challenges that we face in our society today. They're only going to get magnified by the very technology that's connecting us because it's making us intersect. And that intersection doesn't always create the view of everybody now understands everybody and everybody appreciates everybody. So I've had an obsession basically for 30 years. And that obsession has been what makes the difference in the quality of people's lives? What makes a difference in their performance? Because that's what I got hired to do. I got to produce the result now. That's what I've done for 30 years. I get the phone call when the athlete is burning down on national television and they were ahead by five strokes and now they can't get back on the course. And I got to do something right now to get the result and nothing matters. I get the phone call when the child is going to commit suicide and I got to do something right now. And in 29 years, I'm very grateful to tell you I've never lost one in 29 years. It doesn't mean I won't someday, but I haven't done it. And the reason is an understanding of these human needs that I want to talk to you about. Um, so when I get those calls about performance, that's one thing, like how do you make a change? But also I'm looking to see what is it that's shaping that person's ability to contribute, to do something beyond themselves. So maybe the real question is, you know, I look at life and say there's two master lessons. One is there's the science of achievement, which almost everyone in this room has mastered to an amazing extent. That's how do you take the invisible and make it visible, right? How do you take what you dream about and make it happen? Whether it be your business, your contribution to society, money, whatever it is for you, your body, your family. But the other lesson of life that is rarely mastered is the art of fulfillment. Because science is easy, right? We know the rules. You write the code. You follow those. And you get the result. Once you know the game, you just, you know, you up the ante, don't you? But when it comes to fulfillment, that's an art. And the reason is it's about appreciation and it's about contribution. You can only feel so much by yourself. So I've had an interesting laboratory to try to answer the question of the real question, which is what's the difference in somebody's life if you look at somebody like those people that you've given everything to, like the, all the resources they say they need. You gave them not a $100 computer, you gave them the best computer. You gave them love, you gave them joy, you were there to comfort them. And those people very often, and you know some of them, I'm sure, end up the rest of their life with all this love, education, money, and background, spending their life going in and out of rehab. Yeah. And then you meet people that have been through ultimate pain, psychologically, sexually, spiritually, emotionally abused, and not always, but often they become some of the people that contribute the most to society. So the question we've got to ask ourselves really is, what is it? What is it that shapes us? And we live in a therapy culture. Most of us don't do that, but the culture is a therapy culture. And what I mean by that is the mindset that we are our past. And everybody in this room, you wouldn't be in this room if you bought that theory, but the, most of society thinks biography is destiny. The past equals the future. And of course it does if you live there. But what people in this room know, and what we have to remind ourselves though, because you can know something intellectually. You can know what to do and then not use it, not apply it. So really what we got to remind ourselves is decision is the ultimate power. That's what it really is. Now, when you ask people, you know, have you failed to achieve something? How many have ever failed to achieve something significant in your life? Say, I. <laughs> Thanks for the interaction on a high level there. <laughs> but if you, if you ask people, why didn't you achieve something? Somebody who's working for you, you know, or a partner, or even yourself, and you failed to achieve a goal, what's the reason people say they failed to achieve? What do they tell you? Don't have the, didn't know enough, didn't have the knowledge, didn't have the money, didn't have the time, didn't have the technology, you know, I didn't have the right manager, <laughs> didn't have the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, and, what do all those including the Supreme Court have in common? They are a claim to you missing resources. And they may be accurate. You may not have the money. You may not have the Supreme Court. But that is not the defining factor. <laughs> and you correct me if I'm wrong. The defining factor is never resources, it's resourcefulness. And what I mean specifically, rather than just some phrase, is if you have emotion, human emotion, something that I experienced from you day before yesterday at a level that is as profound as I've ever experienced and if you'd communicated with that emotion, I believe you would have beat his ass and won. But 
how easy for me to tell him what he should do. <laughs> Idiot, Robbins. But I know when we watched the debate, when we watched the debate at that time, there were emotions that blocked people's ability to get this man's intellect and capacity and the way they came across to some people in that day. Because I know people that wanted to vote in your direction and didn't, and I was upset. But there was emotion that was there. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say I. I. So emotion is it. And if we get the right emotion, we can get ourselves to do anything. We can get through it. If you're creative enough, playful enough, fun enough, can you get through to anybody, yes or no? Yeah. If you don't have the money, but you're creative or determined enough, you find the way. So this is the ultimate resource, but this is not the story that people tell us, right? The story people tell us is a bunch of different stories. They tell us we don't have the resources, but ultimately, if you take a look here, flip it up if you would. They say, what are all the reasons they have in common? We said that, next one, please. He's broken my pattern, that son of a bitch. <laughs> but I appreciated the energy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> What determines your resources? We've said decision shape destiny, which is my focus here. If decision shape destiny, what determines it is three decisions. What are you gonna focus on? Right now, you have to decide what you're gonna focus on. In this second, consciously or unconsciously, the minute you decide to focus on something, you gotta give it a meaning. And whatever that meaning is produces emotion. Is this the end or the beginning? Is God punishing me or rewarding me or is this the roll of the dice? And emotion then creates what we're gonna do or the action. So think about your own life, the decisions that have shaped your destiny. And that sounds really heavy, but in the last five or 10 years, 15 years, haven't there been some decisions you've made that if you made a different decision, your life would be completely different? How many can think of one, honestly? Better or worse, say I. So the bottom line is maybe it was where to go to work and you met the love of your life there. Maybe it was a career decision. I know the Google geniuses I saw here. I mean, I understand that their decision was to sell their technology at first. What if they made that decision versus to build their own culture? How would the world be different? How would their lives be different? Their impact. The history of our world is these decisions. When a woman stands up and says, no, I won't go to the back of the bus, she didn't just affect her life. That decision shaped our culture. Or someone standing in front of a tank. Or being in a position like Lance Armstrong and someone says to you, you've got testicular cancer. That's pretty tough for any male, especially if you ride a bike. <laughs> You got in your brain, you got in your lungs. But what was his decision of what to focus on? Different than most people. What did it mean? It wasn't the end, it was the beginning. What am I gonna do? He goes off and wins seven championships. He never wants once before the cancer because he got emotional fitness, psychological strength. That's the difference in human beings that I've seen of the three million I've been around. Because that's about my lab. I've had three million people from 80 different countries that I've had a chance to interact with over the last 29 years. And after a while, patterns become obvious. You see that South America and Africa may be connected in a certain way, right? Other people say, oh, that sounds ridiculous. It's simple. So what shape Lance, what shapes you? Two invisible forces, very quickly. One, state. We all have had times. Have you had a time you did something and after you did it, you thought to yourself, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. That was so stupid. Who's been there? Say, I. I. Have you ever done something after you do it? You go, mm -mm -mm. that was me. <laughs> <laughs> right? It wasn't your ability. It was your state. Your model of the world is what shapes you long term. Your model of the world is the filter. That's what's shaping us. That's what makes people make decisions. We want to influence somebody. We've got to know what already influences them. And it's made about three parts, I believe. First, what's your target? What are you after? Which I believe it's not your desires. You can get your desires or goals. How many of you ever got a goal or desire and thought, is this all there is? How many have been there? Say, I. Yeah. So it's needs we have. I believe there are six human needs. Second, once you know what the target that's driving you is and you uncover it for the truth, you don't form it, you uncover it. Then you find out what's your map. What's the belief systems that are telling you how to get those needs? Some people think the way to get those needs is destroy the world. Some people is to build something, create something, love someone. And then there's the fuel you pick. So very quickly, six needs. Let me tell you what they are. First one, certainty. Now these are not goals or desires. These are universal. Everyone needs certainty that they can avoid pain and at least be comfortable. Now how do you get it? Control everybody, develop a skill, give up, smoke a cigarette. And if you got totally certain, ironically, even though we all need that, like you're not certain about your health or your children or money, you don't think about much more. You're not sure the ceiling's gonna hold up. You're gonna listen to any speaker. But while we go for certainty differently, if we get total certainty, we get what? What do you feel if you're certain? You know, what's gonna happen? When it's gonna happen? How it's gonna happen? What would you feel? Bored out of your mind. So God, in her infinite wisdom, <laughs> gave us a second human need, which is uncertainty. We need variety. We need surprise. How many of you here love surprises? Say aye. Bullshit. You like the surprises you want. <laughs> the ones you don't want, you call problems, but you need them. 
So variety is important. Have you ever rented a video or a film that you've already seen? Who's done this? Get a fucking life. <laughs> Right? Why are you doing it? You're certain it's good because you read it before, saw it before, but you're hoping it's been long enough you've forgotten if there's variety. Third human need, critical, significance. We all need to feel important, special, unique. You can get it by making more money. You can do it by being more spiritual. You can do it by getting yourself in a situation where you put more tattoos and earrings in places humans don't want to know. <laughs> Whatever it takes. The fastest way to do this if you have no background, no culture, and no belief in resources or resourcefulness is violence. If I put a gun to your head and I live in the hood, instantly I'm significant. Zero to 10, how high? 10. How certain am I and you're gonna to respond to me? 10. How much uncertainty? Who knows what's gonna happen next? Kind of exciting. Like climbing up into a cave and doing that stuff all the way down there. Total variety and uncertainty. And it's significant, isn't it? So you're willing to risk your life for it. So that's why violence has always been around and will be around unless we have a consciousness change as a species. Now you can get significance in a million ways, but to be significant, you gotta be unique and different. Here's what we really need. Connection and love, fourth need. We all want it. Most people settle for connection because love's too scary. Don't want to get hurt. Who here has ever been hurt in an intimate relationship? Say I. <laughs> if you don't raise your hand, you'll have that other shit too. Come on. <laughs> and you're going to get hurt again. Aren't you glad you came to this positive visit? <laughs> but here's what's true. We need it. We can do it through intimacy, through friendship, through prayer, through walking in nature. If nothing else works for you, get a dog. Don't get a cat, get a dog. Because if you leave for two minutes, it's like you've been gone for six months when you show back up again five minutes later, right? Now, these first four needs, every human finds a way to meet. Even if you lie to yourself, you need to have split personalities. But the last two needs, the first four needs are called the needs of the personality, is what I call it. The last two are the needs of the spirit. And this is where fulfillment comes. You won't get fulfillment from the first four. You'll figure a way, smoke, drink, do whatever, meet the first four. But the last two, number five, you must grow. We all know the answer here. If you don't grow, you what? If a relationship's not growing, if a business is not growing, if you're not growing, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how many friends you have, how many people love you, you feel like how? And the reason we grow, I believe, is so we have something to give of value. Because the sixth need is to contribute beyond ourselves. Because we all know, corny as it sounds, the secret of living is giving. We all know life's not about me, it's about we. This culture knows that, this room knows that. And it's exciting. When you see Nicholas up here talking about his $100 computer, the most passionate, exciting thing is here's a genius, but he's got a calling now. You can feel the difference in him, and it's beautiful. And that calling can touch other people. In my own life, my life was touched because when I was 11 years old, Thanksgiving, no money, no food, and we're not gonna starve, but my father was totally messed up. My mom was letting him know how bad he messed up. And somebody came to the door and delivered food. My father made three decisions. I know what they were briefly. His focus was, this is charity. What does it mean? I'm worthless. What do I got to do? Leave my family, which he did. At the time, one of the most painful experiences of life. My three decisions gave me a different path. I said, focus on, there's food. What a concept. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Second, but this is what changed my life. This is what shaped me as a human being. Somebody's gift. I don't even know who it is. I thought, my father always said, no one gives a shit. And all of a sudden, somebody I don't know, they're not asking for us, giving our family food, looking out for us. It made me believe this. What does it mean that strangers care? And what that made me decide is strangers care about me and my family. I care about them. What am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to do something to make a difference. So when I was 17, I went out one day on Thanksgiving. It was my target for years. Have enough money to feed two families. Most fun thing I ever did in my life. Most moving. Then next year, I did four. And I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. Next year, eight. I wasn't doing it for brownie points, but after eight, I thought, shit, I could use some help. <laughs> so sure enough, I went out, and what did I do? I got my friends involved, and I grew companies, and then I got 11 companies, and I built the foundation. Now, 18 years later, I'm proud to tell you, last year we fed 2 million people in 35 countries through our foundation, all during the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all the different countries around the world. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't tell you that to brag. I tell you because I'm proud of human beings because they get excited to contribute once they've had the chance to experience it and not talk about it. Mm -hmm. So finally, now I'm about out of time. The, the target that shapes you, it, here's what's different about people. We have the same needs, but are you a certainty freak? Is that what you value most or uncertainty? This man here couldn't be a certainty freak if he climbed those, through those caves. Are you driven by significance or love? We all need all six, but whatever your lead system is tilts you in a different direction. And as you move in a direction, you have a destination or a destiny. The second piece is the map. Think of that as the operating system tells you how to get there. And some people's map is, I'm gonna save lives even if I die for other people. And there are firemen, somebody else says, I'm gonna kill people to do it. 
They're trying to meet the same needs of significance, right? They want to honor God or honor their family, but they have a different map. And there are seven different beliefs. I can't go through them because I'm done. The last piece is emotion. I say one of the parts of the map is like time. Some people's idea of a long time is 100 years. Somebody else says is three seconds, which is what I have. <laughs> and the last one I've already mentioned that fell to you. If you got a target and you got a map, and let's say, uh, I can't use Google because I love Macs and they haven't made it good for Macs yet. So if you use MapQuest, how many have made this fatal mistake of using MapQuest at some time? You use this thing and you don't get there. Well, imagine if your beliefs guarantee you can never get to where you want to go. The last thing is emotion. Now, here's what I'll tell you about emotion. There are 6,000 emotions that we all have words for in the English language, which is a linguistic representation, right? It changes by language. But if your dominant emotions, if I, you know, I have more time, I have 20,000 people or 1,000, and I have them write down all the emotions that they experience in an average week, and I give them as long as they need, and on one side they write empowering emotions, the other is disempowering. Guess how many emotions people experience? Less than 12. And half of those make them feel like shit. So they got five or six good freaking feelings. Right? It's like they feel happy, happy, excited, oh shit, frustrated, frustrated, overwhelmed, depressed. How many of you know somebody who no matter what happens finds a way to get pissed off? How many know somebody like this? <laughs> or no matter what happens, no matter what happens, they find a way to be happy or excited. How many know somebody like this? Come on. When 911 happened, and I'll finish with this, I was in Hawaii. I was with 2,000 people from 45 countries. We were translating four languages simultaneously for a program that I was conducting for a week. The night before was called Emotional Mastery. I got up, had no plan for this, and I said, uh, we had all this fireworks, I do crazy shit, fun stuff. And then at the end I stopped, and I had this plan I was gonna say, but I never do what I'm gonna say. And all of a sudden I said, when do people really start to live? When they face death. And I went through this whole thing about, if you were gonna get off this island, if nine days from now you were gonna die, who would you call, what would you say, what would you do? One woman, well that night is when 9 one happened. One woman had come to the seminar, and when she came there, she, her previous boyfriend had been kidnapped and murdered. Her friend, or her new boyfriend, wanted to marry her, and she said no. He said, if you leave and go to that Hawaii thing, it's over with us. She said, it's over. When I finished that night, she called him and left a message, true story, at the top of the World Trade Center where he worked, saying, honey, I love you. I just want you to know, I, I want to marry you. It was stupid of me. She was asleep, because it was 3 a.m. for us, when he called her back from the top and said, honey, I can't tell you what this means. He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you give me the greatest gift because I'm gonna die. Aww. And she played the recording for us in the room. She was on Larry King later. And he said, you're probably wondering how on earth this could happen to you twice. And he said, all I can say to you is, this must be God's message to you, honey. From now on, every day, give your all, love your all. Don't let anything ever stop you. She finishes and a man stands up and he says, I'm from Pakistan, I'm a Muslim. I'd love to hold your hand and say, I'm sorry, but frankly, this is retribution. I can't tell you the rest because I'm out of time. <laughs> 10 seconds. 10 seconds, no, I want to be respectful. 10 seconds, all I can tell you is I brought this man on stage with a man from New York who worked in the World Trade Center, because I had about 200 New Yorkers there. More than 50 lost their entire companies, their friends, marking off their Palm Pilots, one financial trader, this woman made a steal, bawling, 30 friends crossing off that all died. And what I did to people is that, what are we gonna focus on? What does this mean and what, what are we gonna do? And I took the group and got people to focus on, if you didn't lose somebody today, your focus could be how to serve somebody else. There are people, there were one who got him, she was so angry and screaming and yelling. Then I found she wasn't from New York, she's not an American, she doesn't know anybody here. I said, you always get angry. She said, yes. Guilty people got guilty, sad people got sad. And I took these two men and did what I call an indirect negotiation. Jewish man with family in the occupied territory, some New York who would have died if he was at work that day. And this man who wanted to be a terrorist and made it very clear. And the integration that happened is on a film, which I'll be happy to send you. So you can really see what actually happened instead of my verbalization of it. But the two of them not only came together and changed their beliefs and models of the world, but they worked together to bring, for almost four years now, to various mosques and synagogues, the idea of how to create peace. And he wrote a book, which is called My Jihad, My Way of Peace. So transformation can happen. So my invitation to you is this. Explore your web, the web in here. The needs, the beliefs, the emotions that are controlling you for two reasons. So there's more of you to give. Yeah, achieve too. We all want to do it. But I mean, give. Because that's what's going to fill you up. And secondly, so you can appreciate, not just understand, that's intellectual, that's mind, but appreciate 
What's driving other people? It's the only way our world's going to change. God bless you. Thank you. I hope this will serve. What do you love it? Because we were in the dark. There you go. How are you guys doing? Now we're in the light. Time to wake up. So I want to um, just get a show of it. How many people knew of Tony before they came in tonight? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Knew of him, right? How many people had a, how do I say it? I'll just say it. Um, how many of you had kind of a negative or not, you know, like, not like, there's Tony. You know, how many had kind of had a little feeling about, yeah, we talked about that, didn't we? Uh, yeah, and Rob back there. Just kind of a mixed feeling about him. Um, and then others, and, and probably the ones that did, they're not here. And then there's other people that, that would like to know. And what I really, uh, and the reason I bring it up is because I know a lot of people who do not take him seriously in the spirit spiritual world. And um, what's interesting about that is if I ask them what they know about him, they'll usually say, I don't know anything about him. I just know I saw what I call clips, what I call snapshots, as we've all done in life. And we have these snapshots of things, and then we just make a judgment about it, and then we base it, and then we live our lives by it. So, right here. Yes. Tony Robbins had a big effect on part of my family. One of the young men that worked with him right for off the start, Richard, is Richard Green, was his right hand man, and today Richard's gone on to do for him fantastic, fantastic things. Yeah. And another thing I was thank you. Another thing I was telling Rita is that. Being so immersed, and he talks a lot about that, immersing in all these tapes all week, almost to a point of like you're swimming really deep in it. And I said to Rita, I felt a little inadequate, which shocked me, because I don't usually feel that, and I'm doing a lot in the world. So I was wondering why that did, and it's because he was shining a light and saying, and this is what I got out of it, wasn't that, and I thought, oh, this is an awful feeling. I was having such a good, inspiring time behind the computer, and I was journaling and, and just having a time and creating new ideas in my head. And I went, oh, my light was shone, it shined upon my potentiality that I wasn't using fully. Because I would imagine that no one's using their potentiality fully, or we would probably be on another galaxy or doing whatever we're doing. Um, but I, I, I do know that we are continually swimming in our potentiality. But I love that feeling of being honest enough with myself to go, oh, Tony, you've usually inspired me and now I'm a little actually depressed. Uh, what, and I went, oh, because there's something more for me to be. There's not, there's not do, but there's more for me to become. There's more, as he says, we, and as it, it's just so interesting how it's such an alignment like with Ernest Holmes, who doesn't look anything like him and probably never did a talk like him with that kind of energy. But I'll tell you something about Ernest Holmes, the founder of Science of Mind and Spirit. He, to me, if I'm looking at him and listening to him, he can appear dull. In, in my snapshots, I love what he's saying, but he was filling 2,000 and 3,000. He was filling the kind of places that, that Tony was because we're attracted to the, the information and we're, and we're attracted to the feeling. And something that's interesting too that, that, that I got this week was about money. And a lot of people think that, you know, this is all about money. I mean, it's $5,000 for six days at his, con you know, concert, because he is like a rock star when he's there, and five, five grand, and people are, th there's judgment behind that. It's like, I don't know why, and I don't really care, but what I do know is that he had a, something powerful to say, and I might have said it on Sunday, but he said when he was poor, and I think we can all perhaps relate to this in one way or the other, when he was poor, he thought that all he had to do was become rich, 
and he would be loved. And he thought the reason people didn't like him or listen to him or, or is because they knew his flawed family, flawed background. So when he got, made all this money, he went from making 38000 a year as a janitor to making $30 million, you know, seven, eight years later. He celebrated that, and he couldn't wait to share that, especially with his friends. You know how it is you go away and you go, can't wait to get back to my friends and tell them, whoa, look what happened. Remember Tony? Remember Tony? Poor Tony? Hey, let's go to, he even says, let's go to Egypt and race camels, and, and I've got the money, and I've got the, and they said, Tony, man, are all you, is that all you're into is money now? And he's like, I'm really confused, because why? Because he's like sitting there thinking, I thought everybody was going to love me when I had money. And then he had that moment, that light, that said, no, I'm not just into money. I'm just not into poverty anymore. And I thought, that's powerful. That's powerful to have that kind of, that understanding of yourself. And I think there's a lot of times that, that I know that when people are wealthy, they go, oh, they care about us money. I think it's once again, the spotlight is coming back upon self and it's saying, what have I done with my life? And there's a guilt thing that, do, for me, doesn't have to be there, but there, that could be some of the reason for judgment, is what I'm saying. So, I, I pulled this from what he just did because I thought it was worth actually seeing, you know, up on the... Actually, so in case you want to take a little picture, however we do this, decisions... This is called decision S. Decisions of destiny. Three decisions we are making in every moment. What am I going to focus on? And we all know what that is, right? I mean, he described it. There's the person that can always find the disgruntled person in the world. And this goes right back with science of mind. What we focus on is what we will experience. We have to. Because wherever you point anything, that's what, what do they say, you know? Anything you point towards is, is, is exactly your destination. Focus equals feeling. Feeling, once again, is the whole, is the entire principle of science of mind and spirit. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because I want to just see how we're all really saying the same thing. And so behind every feeling, nothing is going to happen if you have no feeling for it. No passion. I, I'm a big passion.